I feel like I spend half my life doing laundry. I'll sit down to fold a basket of clothes. It doesn't look too bad. It's barely even full. But then I start folding and folding and folding. And I realize this is actually like five baskets of clothes. They're just all miniature, tiny toddler sized shirts take up hardly any room in the laundry basket, but they're just as hard to fold as an adult sized shirt. Harder even. I complain. Ugh, I don't wanna. My husband really complains. Laundry is the bane of his existence. But honestly, we've got it so good. We put the dirty clothes in a machine that's in our house, press a button, and go about our day. Yes, at some point we have to move them to another machine, press another button, and then go about our day again while they dry, and then we take them out and we fold them or hang them or whatever. That's doing laundry in middle-class America today. But... Did you know, laundry wasn't always that simple. Laundry was a complete nightmare for almost all of history. A nightmare that literally everyone depended on, but never talked about. Let's fix that. Hello, I'm Shayla Fontaine, and you're listening to History Fix, where I discuss lesser-known true stories from history you won't be able to stop thinking about. Today, we're talking about laundry, but I promise it won't be boring. It will be eye-opening, perspective-shifting. I, for one, will never complain about doing laundry ever again. I mean, We'll see. I probably still will. As I mentioned in last week's episode, when I was researching Rana Valona, I came upon a podcast called Her Half of History. It was one of the few sources I could find about her, and it was literally the only one that didn't immediately buy into the hype and throw her under the bus as a bloodthirsty evil tyrant. Lori gave Rana Valona a chance, and I was like, I like this girl. I like this podcast. So I actually reached out to Lori to see if she would join us on History Fix. And she was down. And here she is. My name is Lori Davis, and I have a podcast called Her Half of History. So I do women's history, and I do mine in um, different series that are based around a topic. So there have been series like uh, Women Who Seized Power, there have been series like Women Who Escaped Slavery, but I also really like the social history where we talk about ordinary women because most of the women that you can do a biography about, um, they're they're unusual, right? Most women in history, there's just not enough there, but you can still talk about what their lives were like. So I also have series about, you know, housework and what it was like to do housework or what it was like, what it meant to get married or things that ordinary women did as well. Right. I love that. And when I, so I st- kind of stumbled upon your podcast because I was looking into Rana Valona and there really, there wasn't much out there. There's like not that many sources. And, and I found your episode and you're like the only person that I found that wasn't just like really leaning into this reputation that she had as like this kind of evil. As a monster. Tyrant. Yeah. And you, yeah. Were, you were literally like the only one who kind of like oh, okay. gave her a chance. And I was like, oh, I, I love this. Like I have to reach out to her because that's well, kind of, thank you. yeah, because that's kind of my thing too. I'm like, you know, I want to like sort of question that stuff and poke holes in it and go like, okay, well, who, where are these reports coming from? Is this reliable? And, you know, with her, especially it's like, well, these reports are coming from people who disliked her and were being exactly. like, exactly, by exactly. her. And there's not a ton written about her. There's not a lot of secondary sources and things like that. So um, I I agree. The ones I read just went full on into the, she is a completely terrible person. And I feel like, I mean, I don't know anybody who's a completely terrible person. So maybe there's, you know, there's got to be some other aspects of her personality. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. So I love that you, that I feel like we're like, like like-minded in that way that, you know, you kind of saw through that. And so that's, that's beautiful. But so today we're talking about laundry, like you said, some of these kind of um, household, which I love because it's like, it's very mundane, but at the same time, it's like, so secretly important. It is. Uh, so I, it is. <laughs> right. And just sort of like an underlying thing in everyone's lives forever. So I'm super excited for you to share with us today. So I guess let's just go back to like the very beginning. What is like the earliest laundry like? 
Right. So there we have to go into pure speculation because the earliest beginnings, there's no record of it at all, right? So laundry has to be as old as clothing itself. So we're talking prehistoric, tens of thousands of years old, depending on what area of the world you were in. The, the thing that I think most modern people don't really realize is just how incredibly expensive clothing was. I mean, now you can go down to your local big store where, you know, it, it's sure it costs more than you would like it to cost, but it's trivial, trivial compared with the way it used to be, because there's an enormous amount of work involved when you're starting getting dressed with something like a cotton plant. Okay, there's a ton of work. So it's very expensive. And then you need to keep it clean. You can't afford to just get rid of it, right? You've got to keep it clean. So the simplest, simplest method is simply to wade out into your local river and and dunk it. And that doesn't leave any trace, right? There's no there's no record of that archaeologically. There's also nobody writing any of that down, even when there were records, because one thing I can also tell you about all of the written records. The people who wrote stuff down weren't doing their own laundry. Right. Those, those are for class people. <laughs> so they don't they do not do their own laundry. They hire it out or they have some woman that they're related to. And they probably, have, no, they probably have no idea how it's even done. No, nor have <laughs> they ever thought about it. You just send it away and it comes back clean. <laughs> so that's the simplest method. You just go out in the water and you just use water. You can also, you know, start pounding it with rocks or sticks and that'll help maybe dislodge the dirt and also the vermin because that would have been an issue as well. Um, and there are some plants in the world that are helpful. There's a, there's a plant called soapwort and there are other plants that can build up a little bit of a lather and they can help you out with that. But those aren't available year round and they aren't available in all locations. So there are a few other substances that are a lot more readily available for soap and not one of them are the kind of thing that I would ever have thought, oh, that will be a cleaning agent. <laughs> you just wouldn't think that. So the main, the main one that gets used a lot is called lye and you get lye by taking the ashes of your wood fire and you soak it in water and then you strain it and the water that comes out, that's called lye. Now, would you think that wood ashes would help you clean anything? <laughs> no, but it is a cleaning agent, right? So that's the most common. And then you can actually make it into soap by mixing it with animal fat, which also I would not have thought would no. make clothes those cleaner. Seem, those seem like two like they would exactly make exactly the wrong things to use. <laughs> right. But that's what soap is. It's an animal fat or I mean I guess it could be a plant fat as well but a fat mixed with this lye yeah I've heard of lye I feel like I've heard that so much and I've never known what that was <laughs> I've never I didn't either <laughs> I didn't either the other thing is it's caustic you know it'll burn your skin if you if you aren't careful with it right so that is primarily what people used around the world except for when they used another substance that you would never have thought of which is urine because urine has ammonia in it. So you can use urine to clean your clothes. Again, would you like who who even thought of this? You gotta wonder, but it's all prehistoric. That is so funny. When I when I first started my podcast, it's all kind of like lesser known or like misunderstood stuff. And my mom was like throwing out some ideas. She was like, you should do an episode on urine, on the uses of urine. And I was like, no, like that's <laughs> that's like a terrible idea. And I'm like, Tell it your mom, is. we're doing that right now. <laughs> Here we go. She's gonna love this. <laughs> So right. <laughs> right. So those are the basic sources. Um, and you can take that out into the river with you um, to help clean the clothes. And that's how it's done for centuries and centuries and centuries. What changes is, and this changes at different times, again, depending on where you are, is if you live in an urban environment, there might not be a river right there there for you to go down to, right? You might be getting your water from a well or a pump or something like that. And it's also true that it can go a little better if you can control the temperature of the water, right? right. Which you can't do when it's in the river. The downside of that is you have to haul the water. Like you have to literally get the water somewhere where you can build a fire and heat it up. And that is an awful lot of work yeah. as well. So when you get into the later periods, well, we can talk about in Rome, we ha actually have evidence of commercial laundries 
um, th there are the ruins and they have different rooms that the floors are at slightly different levels. So the water will drain into other places. And they actually climbed in and they stamped with their feet. Oh, wow. Like, like, like yeah. making wine, like the grapes. <laughs> right, exactly. The other interesting thing about the Roman ones is from what we can tell from pictures, um, it may have been men who did it which is great. It's not a female thing. Not so great because they were probably slaves. They're right, probably enslaved. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. not that great. But it just means that at least some people could just send out their laundry to the commercial laundry and then you get it back and it's great. Mm -hmm. um, later on, it becomes a specifically female task. It's part of the household work. And you would either go down to the river or you need to haul the water from a pump or a well. We don't really have great sources because, again, the women who did this are not the ones who leave us sources until we get to like the 19th century. And by then there was enough of a middle class that there's a market for books on how to be a good housewife. And that's the first point where anybody really writes down, this is how you should do this. Wow. Yeah. Like to teach other women. Yeah. To teach other women how you can do this efficiently and how you can, you know, get this kind of stain out or that kind of stain out. And by then you read these descriptions and it, I mean, it's intense what they're doing. They all agree that laundry is the absolute worst task of all the household tasks. Laundry is the worst because you have to haul all that water. You have to heat up all of that water. It will take you all day to do a small load. But I mean, that's how long it will take. It will take all day. Lori didn't go into detail in our interview about what all was spelled out in those 19th century books for housewives about how to do your laundry, but she does in her podcast episode about laundry for her half of history. She reads an excerpt from a book written by Catherine Beecher, who was actually the older sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. You've probably heard of Harriet. She was an abolitionist who wrote the very famous novel Uncle Tom's Cabin which really illustrated the unbearable and inhumane living conditions that enslaved people were forced to endure in America. It was incredibly eye-opening at a time when people needed to open their eyes. Catherine Beecher, her sister, was an educator and an author and a social activist too, honestly. She championed for equal access to education for women and supported the incorporation of kindergarten into children's schooling. And she also basically pioneered the concept of physical education, PE, for girls. The Beecher parents should be very, very proud of their daughters. Harriet and Catherine were nothing short of complete inspirations. But Catherine also wrote books that included detailed instructions for how to properly do laundry, like Lori mentioned there. Here's what Catherine instructs in her 1873 book, Miss Beecher's Housekeeper and Healthkeeper. Quote, First, you must gather your materials, namely plenty of soft water, lye, soda, and borax. Two wash forms are needed, one for the two tubs in which to put the suds, and the other for bluing and starching tubs. Four tubs of different sizes are necessary. Also a large wooden dipper, as metal is apt to rust, two or three pails, a grooved washboard, a clothesline, seagrass or horsehair is best, a wash stick to move clothes when boiling, and a wooden fork to take them out. Soap dishes made to hook onto the tubs save soap and time. Provide also a clothes bag in which to boil clothes, an indigo bag of double flannel, a starch strainer of coarse linen, a bottle of ox gall for calicoes, a supply of starch, neither sour nor musty, several dozens of clothespins, which are cleft sticks used to fasten clothes on the line, a bottle of dissolved gum arabic, two clothes baskets, and a brass or copper kettle for boiling clothes as iron is apt to rust. So that's just the materials <laughs> right there. That's just what you need to get started. It's basically a Hogwarts first year student supply list. Like certainly indigo bags, copper kettles, and ox gall are only sold in Diagon Alley. And then she goes on about how to actually do the laundry with these things. Quote, assort the clothes and put those most soiled in soak the night before. 
Never pour hot water on them as it sets the dirt. In a sorting clothes, put the flannels in one lot, the colored clothes in another, the coarse white ones in a third, and the fine white clothes in a fourth lot. Wash the fine clothes in one tub of suds. When the clothes are very much soiled, a second suds is needful, turning them wrong side out. Put them in the boiling bag and boil them in strong suds for half an hour and not much more. Move them while boiling with a clothes stick. Take them out of the boiling bag and put them into a tub of water and rub the dirtiest places again if need be. Throw them into the rinsing water and then wring them out and put them into the bluing water. Put the articles to be stiffened into a clothes basket by themselves, and just before hanging out, dip them in starch, clapping it in so as to have them equally stiff in all parts. Hang white clothes in the sun and colored ones wrong side out in the shade. Fasten them with clothespins, then wash the coarser white articles in the same manner, then wash the colored clothes. These must not be soaked, nor have lye or soda put in the water, and they ought not to lie wet long before hanging out as it injures their colors. Beef skull, one spoonful to two pails full of suds, improves calicoes. Lastly, wash the flannels in suds as hot as the hand can bear. Never rub on soap as this shrinks them in spots. Wring them out of the first suds and throw them into another tub of hot suds, turning them wrong side out. Then throw them into hot bluing water. Do not put bluing into suds as it makes specks in the flannel. Never leave flannels long in water, nor put them in cold or lukewarm water. Before hanging them out, shake and stretch them. Some housekeepers have a clothes closet made with slats across the top. On these slats, they put their flannels when ready to hang out and then burn brimstone under them for 10 minutes. End quote. Holy moly. <laughs> like, what? Lori had a similar reaction. I just kind of burst out laughing when I read because they go through this extremely long list of everything that you're doing to get this done. But in the list of instructions, um, towards the end, when you're when you're when they're you're pulling them out, you've wrung them out as much as you can. She actually suggests that you burn brimstone underneath them because the smoke will drive out the vermin. And I kind of laughed because I was already thinking that this kind of sounded like hell. <laughs> and then you actually burn brimstone. As well. It's actual hell. Oh my gosh, that is too funny. <laughs> right. Now, I will say when you read these manuals, you wonder how many women were really doing all of that. Right. I mean, I know when I look at, you know, household advice, there's loads of tips on the internet that maybe I should be doing, but I'm actually mm. not. Yeah. So you don't know whether women were really doing all of those steps. Um but it's there. It's in a widely published manual. And I guess I should also say along those lines, um, for women who were poor or who were ill or didn't have, you know, resources, the other thing that they did is they just didn't do it. And you can see that in some pictures of the 19th century when the photography came in. And there were people who went around taking pictures of or families in the South, or especially when social activism became a thing, and they were trying to say, look, this is how people actually live. And you look at the pictures, and you realize they are dirty, yeah. they are dirty. Yeah. And so sometimes, you know, I've read and, you know, things, uh, you know, you think Charles Dickens, or other people who wrote things, and they describe the poor as dirty, and you think, oh, they're just being snobs, they're being, you know, classy. But actually, it's because being clean, took an enormous amount of effort and money. And so if you didn't have the resources, you just didn't do it. And you were literally dirty, not because you wanted to be, but because yeah, you, you couldn't do anything about it. Right. I mean, the laundry, yeah. but then also just taking a bath, like that's a lot of hauling right. water and heating it, is. it up. And it is. Yeah. yeah. I feel like I've seen a lot of photos from like de the depression era, like the 1930s, even, um, right. you know, you'll see like, and the kids and they're just like covered in dirt the poor things but yeah it's like they didn't want to be dirty they just didn't have the means to to take care of it yeah, yeah. 
I was so glad Lori brought that up. These old pictures of people just covered in dirt and grime. I come across them quite often when looking for images for certain episodes, and it's always a little startling. Like, what in the world? Somebody wash this poor child. But once you understand what an absolutely enormous job laundry was, how much time it took, how much energy it took, how many supplies you actually needed, it sort of makes sense. I would have the dirtiest kids ever if I had to do all of that to keep them clean. They're already pretty dirty, especially now that it's warm outside and we're playing in the yard like all day. They get real dirty. They just do. But if that's what it took to clean them, yeah, we might just embrace the dirt. And it's not just me. Laundry was the most dreaded chore. Catherine Beecher called it, quote, the most trying department of housekeeping. So they've done a few little studies of budget things, and they found that if a woman has any discretionary money at all, this is what she spends it on. She spends it on hiring someone else to do the laundry. But the flip side of that is it means that for many women who needed an income, this was an option. I mean, it wasn't didn't make you rich for sure. But if you needed to make money, this was something you could do is you could do laundry. And that must have been true for centuries. We just didn't know about it because they didn't mention it. Right. Like going all the way back to like ancient times. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's a pretty old profession, it seems like, because it was something people needed done. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I always think about when I think of like a long time ago, it always in my head, I'm like, it, it seems like they didn't have very much clothing. Like they were kind of just wearing the same outfit or maybe they had one or two outfits. And I'm sure that varies by culture and, and, you know, socioeconomic status. Yes. But do you know much about like, just did they, you know, now it's like, we have all these clothes and we wear a different outfit every day. And right. I think that's no. still a little bit cultural. Um, but in my head, I'm like, you know, they just didn't have as much clothes, but maybe that's why, because it was such an undertaking to try. Well, to yeah. A couple of things, partly the clothes were so expensive. Right. So if you were wealthy, sure. You had lots of clothes. If you were poor, not so many, or also a common solution that they did for women is you had, you had like an underdress and that you might change every day, but it was covered up with an overdress that wouldn't get as dirty from your you know, from your body because right. it was on the outside. And then you also wore aprons when you were doing things. And those aprons are very, like a lot of the pictures, they look very frilly and white and decorative, but they're actually really functional because it means your dress didn't get dirty right. while you were doing some of these jobs. So you're washing like the underdress and you're washing the apron and kind of trying right. to- keep And maybe it. not washing the actual dress, which that has the sense. actual color in it that might not be color fast you might right. be watching washing the color away when you try I'm to get the sure yeah. yeah yeah when did it become kind of like modern you know with like now we have washing machines and I complain about doing laundry now and it's like so, I know so I know. easy compared to all that <laughs> But when did Seriously, that I don't like doing laundry either, I but know. it really is just dump it in, push a few buttons, yeah. you know, and just, right. yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, we start to see patent applications for washing machines actually in the 1800s, but they didn't really exist, right? It's just somebody mm -hmm. had an idea. It doesn't oh, gotcha. mean there was something on the market for that women could actually buy. Right. Um, so those didn't start to appear until the 1900s. And even then, you're probably getting the wrong idea because they're really just a tub with a crank. Oh, so gotcha. you can manually turn it, but it doesn't drain. It doesn't fill. Like you still have to haul the water and put it in. It's just a way that you can turn this thing and it'll act like the agitator in your washing machine. Um with your own muscle power, obviously. Right. Which is, so those, I mean, the, water's heavy. It's got to be it is, super it is. hard to, to fill and then also to turn. Oh my gosh. One of the women who has researched this, she, she tabulated it all up following the instructions in one of these 19th century manuals of how much water it says you need for different loads. And there's like a soaking phase and then there's the boiling phase and then there's the rinsing phase. She said it's 400 pounds of water for one load. That's what you have to carry. <laughs> And then this is a what this is a women's job. Like this seems like a like men should be doing it just because of the pure Absolutely. physical so labor. That's crazy. Yes. Yes. And not just women, because a lot of um, especially women who did this, 
professionally because they needed to support a family, one of the things your kids can do for you is carry water. Mm -hmm. So you might be sending your kids out, bring the water back, and then you'll do the actual cleaning. That's why everyone had so many kids. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Okay. So those early washing machines, I mean, maybe they're a small improvement, but they're, they're nothing special. Um, But over the years, especially as they're being sold in catalogs like Sears Roebuck, you know, um, we start to get the point where they can be electric because electricity becomes a thing available to some women, but not all women in the early 20th century. So you can do that, but it still doesn't fill itself with water or it certainly doesn't spin dry at the end. It doesn't drain, nothing like that. Uh, But there are gradual improvements. After World War I, American women started to be able to buy washing machines that were a little bit more like what you would think uh, think of. And then by the end of World War II, they were widely available as long as you lived in the right part of the world. So if you lived in Europe or, uh, sorry, Western Europe, or you lived in America, you could buy a washing machine by then. And it did actually fill itself and drain itself it's really actually kind of interesting to look at the ads for these things because they have like all these exclamation marks about things that you're like yeah of course it right. fills like, this water. right so they begin to be pretty generic for women who live in first world countries um you know, between the two world wars, by the end of the world wars. And of course, even today, there are parts of the world where women don't have washing machines. It kind of, it depends on where you, where you live. And then dryers are a whole separate issue. They're later. Yeah. And that, I, I always kind of forget how like American dryers are like a lot of even, even like Western European, even like very developed European countries, they're just not as common. My brother-in-law is Australian and they just like, don't really have dryers. I mean, you know, some people do, but it's not like most people right. don't. And I used to live in Germany and then in Scotland and I didn't have a dryer in either place. I had a washing machine, but not a dryer. So you just hang it dry. That's just what you do. That's part of the home. Um, which actually, in the earlier days, there there's a mother goose rhyme that it's possible that you've heard, or if you've uh, read the Little House on the Prairie series, Ma Ingalls uses it, and it it tells you what your your lineup for the week is, and it always starts with wash on Monday, iron on Tuesday, and there are a lot of variations of it, but it always starts with wash on Monday, and the reason is you have to let those clothes dry. So if you're going to look your best on Sunday. You need to make sure that you wash those clothes on Monday because what if it rains? Right. Like it, it might, might take all it might, it might take days for your clothes to dry before you can even do the ironing, which is kind of required because they didn't have wrinkle resistant fabrics. They're they're wrinkly without those. Um so it, it I mean it will take literally days even after you've finished the heaviest labor, which is hauling all that water, boiling that water. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now I'm like, I don't even like if, if, if the fabric wrinkles, I like won't even buy it. I'm like, my clothes have to come out of the dryer wrinkle free or I'm not, I don't own them. I know we are, we are very spoiled at this stage. I I know. And now I'm thinking about it. Like there's other, you know, household tasks where like, if your dishwasher breaks, you can hand wash dishes, you know, there's, you you can figure out other ways, but like, if my washing machine breaks, like, I'm not going to fill a tub of water and like, start scrubbing my clothes by hand. I'm just going to like, go to a laundromat. Yeah. Like I'm going to find another one. (laughs) Yes. So I feel like that alone shows you how labor intensive and just overwhelming that particular right. task is like we we won't even do it now that we've had washing no, machines like we we'll won't. never go back <laughs> right. I, can't imagine. I agree I mean it's blowing my mind that it that it was relegated as like a, a female task when it is so I can't imagine like hauling that going. much water right and then they called us the weaker sex <laughs> right <laughs> really <laughs> but you know I do think about um it cut, when tasks like become easier and something that you could do as you know by yourself in your house alone, I, it makes me think about. I guess it kind of happened around like uh, World War II or right after when that like um, nuclear family came about, and um, you know you had like instead of multiple generations living in a household or women working together and you know in a sort of a circle of females, then you have like the the mom of the family is kind of isolated uh-huh. and 
she does her laundry and you do your laundry over there at your house and you kind of lose a little bit of the like camaraderie almost when everyone's kind of absolutely so there are even there are even some paintings and and a few things few references to laundry where you realize that if every woman in your community is going down to the river or going to the the community pump or well on Monday morning to do this then everybody you know is kind of doing this together yep. and you see and then you'll friends. be you'll even yeah. if you're in your own like little yard you know your neighbor will be doing the same thing in her yard and so there is a little bit of a social aspect to it which for housework in general vanishes over the 20th century because we don't get together and do housework right it's something you do by yourself and it's not very valued which it used to be because people were aware I mean I'm not saying they paid them what they probably should have paid them but they (laughs) but at least people were aware that this was a a hard skill that took effort and it and it took knowledge you had to know how to treat these different fabrics so as to not damage them with all your pounding and boiling and everything so there was there was a skilled labor aspect to it that isn't there anymore. And the social aspect, as you said, is is completely yeah. gone. Because I'm thinking like, uh, you know, I was thinking like if you had small children, because I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old now, I'm thinking about like if I had to spend all day Monday trying to wash clothes like out in my yard or whatever, like I don't think they would let me do it. I'm like, what would I do? What would my kids be doing? And then I'm like, oh, well, I feel like they kind of had this community where like maybe someone's, someone's watching the kids and someone else is doing right. the laundry. And they, it's kind of like, this right. group or of, your older kids are watching the, or the older oh, exactly kids. the older kids yeah. are watching the younger so it's like more of like a communal thing um and now it just feels like there's so much it's so much easier but it feels like there's so much done just sort of in isolation now I guess as opposed to like within this community of women we're all going down to the stream and we're talking we're chatting while we're doing it and um yeah, so I do feel like maybe I'll, I mean it's much better. I, I wouldn't go back, right. but I do feel we're, like there yes, was we're not going back. <laughs> not going back. But I do feel like there there must have been something lost there socially yeah. and just there was. that support. There network. was for sure. Yeah. yeah, it changed the nature of being a housewife because a housewife used to be, I mean that that was a valuable contributing member, like essential member, and making an economic contribution as well because if you didn't have a housewife doing it then you had to pay someone to do it right so it's not it was it was valued it was valued more than it became later when it was like oh anybody could do that and right doesn't put it in and press a button doesn't matter money so you know women who do that don't matter um Mm -hmm. that wasn't there until the 20th century where it came in still still isn't really true I would I would say that really quickly yeah (laughs) Um, but you know that attitude that they're not contributing or they're not doing something that wasn't there before what a just overwhelming task laundry is it's just and it's Absolutely non-stop terrible. It's like, non-stop. It's non-stop yeah and when those early washing machines came in um there have been some studies that suggest women you know what it did was it restructured their time because you used to spend all day on monday doing it but now maybe it didn't take you all day but you did it every day right you had more clothes and you wash them more frequently. And so women were still doing a lot of laundry, just not all at once yeah. on Monday. And I guess, you know, at the same time that automatic washing machines came in, it's kind of like the industrial revolution. And so they're mass producing clothing at that point as well. And it's becoming more affordable. So it's like, yeah, it almost didn't reduce the task. It just like, because we have more clothes to wash and we're changing our clothes right. more often. It's easier to yeah. wash them, but it's it becomes almost um, a bigger job in a weird a constant. way. A yeah. constant, yeah. And I think that's a yeah. little bit cultural too. I spent um, six weeks in Italy. That was probably like 10 years ago. And I remember just kind of culturally, they would wear the same outfit for like a few days, you know, if it, if it didn't get dirty, okay. if it didn't get really dirty yeah. or sweaty or whatever, you know, they'd wear the same outfit for like three days. And I'm like putting on a new outfit every day. Right. And I think that was just kind of a cultural difference where they're like, well, it's not dirty. I'll just wear it again tomorrow, I'll wear it till it's dirty. And then I'll put on something fresh. So uh, yeah, so I think that even that whole like, I have to wear something different. I, can't, I just you know, I wore this dress to the last wedding, I have to wear a different dress to this or whatever. I think that is a little bit cultural as well. And, you know, we tend to be a bit excessive in America in general. So, <laughs> right. so 
Wow. Well, I feel very uh, fortunate <laughs> to live <laughs> in the modern wish. world of laundry yes. machines and dryers. <laughs> Wait. Oh my gosh. And I still complain. I'm never complaining about laundry again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had, I said that as well when I started researching laundry, but I'm pretty sure I have still complained. <laughs> <laughs> We get used to it, right? Yes, we get used to it. And yeah. you wish they were just magically clean all the time. Perspective is a really wild thing. We moan and complain, even with our miraculous machines that automatically fill with water and wash the clothes for us. We still find reasons to complain. If Catherine Beecher could see a modern washing machine, a dryer, can you even imagine what her reaction would be? But what I love most about the history of laundry is that it exposes the littlest bit. It cracks the facade a tiny bit to expose the history of women. And it reveals really how much women have done throughout time to just keep things functioning, to keep the cogs moving. Lori and I kept coming back to, you know, I can't believe this was a woman's job, lugging 400 pounds of water from a river or a well or whatever per load and they're doing multiple loads three four five loads however many every single monday that's i mean there are men who would cower at the mere thought of such a task and there was no honor and glory no one even paid attention to the fact that it was being done as long as it got done as long as they had clean clothes to wear their good clothes ready to go by sunday it was so behind the scenes and it remained so behind the scenes that it's not something I've really ever even thought about. And that's women's history. That's her half of history. Thank you all so very much for listening to History Fix. I hope you found this story interesting and maybe you even learned something new. A huge, huge thank you to Lori Davis from the Her Half of History podcast for sharing her knowledge with us today. I will link Lori's podcast, Her Half of History, in the description. I really think you guys will dig it. And you can also find Lori on Instagram at Her Half of History. And as always, be sure to follow my Instagram at History Fix Podcast to see some images that go along with this episode and to stay on top of new episodes as they drop. I'd also really appreciate it if you would rate and follow this podcast on whatever app you're using to listen and go ahead and tell a friend or two about it. That'll make it much easier to get your next fix. Information used in this episode was sourced from Lori Davis from Her Half of History podcast, and I've linked her episode on laundry in the description if you'd like to check out her sources. I also included an excerpt from Catherine Beecher's 1873 book, Miss Beecher's Housekeeper and Healthkeeper. That entire book is available through the Library of Congress website, and I will link that in the description as well. <laughs>